cool. Uh, my name is uh, Prince. I'm a member of the interdisciplinary research group from the University of Southampton and Oxford University, and we're called Open Acoustic Devices. Uh, I work with a, a number of people, including uh, Andy Hill, who's in this chat with me. Um, uh, he's another PhD student at the University of Southampton, as well as Alex Rogers, who is a professor at Oxford University. Uh, Patrick Doncaster, who's a professor at Southampton University, and Jake Snadden, who's a lecturer at Southampton University. And we work together to develop, um, we've developed an open source tool for monitoring the environment with sound. And in this presentation, we'll just look at why Open Acoustic Devices was formed and what we have achieved so far, and then what our mission is for the future. Sound is a very powerful mechanism for assessing the health of an ecosystem and also for identifying the presence of elusive species that can't be easily seen, such as insects and things in like environments like this. Uh, this picture is from a nature reserve in Belize in Central America and uh, was a study location for a lot of our research. Now I'm going to try something that may or may not work, but uh, it should be entertaining at least. So uh, I'm going to play, a, few, play um, a couple of sounds, and if you respond in the chat, we'll see if you can guess what the sounds actually are. So I'll play one now. Let's see if this goes. So if you have any idea what this is, you can post in the chat. I'll leave it a couple of seconds. Cool. So that was, uh, that was a toucan. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, can I just interrupt? Is everyone hearing a sound? No. Okay. Uh, I think we're... In which, it, in which case, I shall move on then. Uh, <laughs> that was my favourite part of the presentation. I'm very sorry. There was a sound of a howler monkey, which if anyone has heard before, it sounds terrifying. Um, and no, it wasn't a very quiet mouse. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, our researchers in this area have been hearing a lot more and more of this other sound, which was at this point, I would play the sound of a gunshot. Uh, with human settlement reserves, there are concerns that natural resources are being overexploited for things like for wild meat. Uh, so poaching in Central America is commonly performed by local communities hunt, just hunting for food. They'll use uh, shotguns to shoot at animals at close range. Uh, this picture shows a common technique where hunters will build a platform underneath a fruit tree and wait for animals such as the peccary to come and feed on fruit that have fallen off the tree. And due to how close they are, if a gunshot is heard, then it's almost definitely a kill of one of these animals. In Central America, uh, the jaguar is a species which is really feeling the effects of this poaching as they have to compete with these poachers for their prey. Uh, to investigate the concern of this uh, jaguar having to compete, um, we looked at the possibility of using sounds to monitor poaching in the jaguar's habitat. Our aim was to create a network of acoustic devices which could detect events and better inform us where and when the hunting most commonly occurs. So the main research challenges to do this were, first, what hardware can be used to monitor sound in these remote areas? And two, can we detect gunshot events on the hardware in real time? So an important question to ask whenever you're attempting to answer a question in the tech space like this is, why hasn't it done, been done in this way before? Uh, so why hasn't gunshot detection been done in, using tools like this before? And why is the majority of acoustic analysis done after the recordings have been collected? And one of the reasons for this is acoustic um, monitoring te uh, technology is often too expensive to use at a large scale. For example, this commercial device costs between 800 and 1,000 pounds. And for these commercial devices, their software is almost always closed source, meaning it's difficult to customize them for specific applications. Software is therefore limited to continuous recording applications. Uh, this makes them quite power hungry and quite memory hungry for, uh, to run uh, long-term studies. They're also often too large for you to be able to deploy a significant number of them in the area. So, our first goal uh, was to address the problems of these existing tools and create our own tool. So uh, using uh, techno microphone technology that exists within smartphones, we've developed a low cost fit for purpose acoustic logger called AudioMoth. Uh, we managed to reduce the cost of this device down to about 32 pounds per unit. 
And we did this by limiting computing power, removing the uh, expensive enclosures that would go around it, and removing cable assemblies. We used to use small surface mount components to reduce the size of the device to about that of a credit card, if you can imagine that scaled down a bit on your screen. To solve the second research challenge, uh, we developed a number of onboard acoustic detection techniques. Using real-time detection to filter out what's recorded to memory, we were able to increase the battery life of our devices and reduce the onboard memory requirements for any deployment we intended to do. So the algorithm, detection algorithms we developed, they've varied in complexity. These go from um, just simply using interactions between frequency bands all the way up to using machine learning. So the top plot shows the call of a species of cicada we attempted to monitor. That recording was taken in Slovenia. And the second plot, you show, it shows uh, the behavior of two frequency bands. And the interaction between these two is what allowed us to be able to detect this species in a noisy forest. And you can see on this one, the, the top uh, figure shows the amplitude of a gunshot recorded about 400 meters away from the source. And the second figure shows that same gunshot showing its behavior across all frequencies and has a characteristic decay pattern that appears after the muzzle blast. So you can see it's starting to decay away. Um, using machine learning techniques, we we're able to analyze the various frequency components within this decay and continuously listen for gunshots and record only when we see a pattern similar to this. So about this time last year, we put our first gunshot detection devices um, out uh, in Belize. And a couple of weeks ago, we finally went out there to start collecting the data from them. Uh, using the onboard algorithm, we were able to maintain battery life for a year while collecting useful gunshot data. At the end of 2017, we published um, Audiomoth's hardware and software open source online, making them freely available to the public so that others could share and adopt the product for themselves. Once the project, the publication was out there, we received quite a lot of attention from it. And we ended up having a lot of inquiries from people asking how can they get hold of the Audiomoth and how can they implement it in their research. So Audiomoth's quite simple construction allowed it to be manufactured as a single working unit from one manufacturer, meaning we didn't require multiple manufacturing steps with each one driving up the price. This made it much easier for us to set up a group purchase system where devices could be uh, pulled together for bulk manufacture. By gathering together a large number of orders into one, the unit cost for individual, um, uh, individual researchers uh, it drops the price for them significantly. So together with uh, members of the Wild Labs community and the Arabada Initiative, uh, we initialized uh, the first group purchase campaign and we managed to reduce the price to 32 pounds. And since 2018, we have run seven successful rounds of group purchases and we were able to distribute over 6,000 Audiomoth devices to people working in conservation all around the world. Uh, the latest round started recently, so uh, if you're interested at all in buying Audiomoth, be sure to check out our website after this talk's finished. So we have over a thousand users dis distributed across the globe using Audiomoth for a wide variety of applications. So and ex some examples of these are uh, out in Greenland, we, people have been using Audiomoth to uh, monitor migrating birds. Uh, it's been used in Kenya to monitor large mammal uh, wildlife corridors. It's been used in Malaysia to monitor amphibians in montane forests. And it's also been used to uh, search for bats within Cuba. It's even been used uh, underwater where people have deployed these devices in Florida to listen to manatee and dolphin calls, which is quite a cool one. And we're hoping our work will enable nature reserves, such as the one we've worked with in Belize, to be better managed thanks to affordable monitoring tools, helping jaguars in the area to thrive. Recently, we've been investigating various ways on how to sustain the Audio Moth project. These include how to continue community support after our uh, PhD funding ends. Um, we've also been looking at sustainable business models to support further Audio Moth developments. And we've investigated ways to improve the developer experience um, with GitHub audit services. Uh, we've looked at how best to store and analyze the data that Audiomoth captures. And we also looked at how to combine Audiomoth with a real-time alert system. And with your help, we should be able to sustain this conservation tool, continuing the support for local conservation teams and projects worldwide. 
uh, thank you for listening. I've been uh, so questions, feel free to ask. Um, Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, there's, uh, there are a few questions coming through. Um, the first one was from Chris. Uh, do you want to jump in, Chris? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Can We can indeed. Yes, uh, very interesting project you have there. Uh, certain question i i looked at the group by and you're using mems technology but you also said you're looking at bats so certainly interested in the frequency range of these and whether they can also just be deployed and harvested like camera traps if you're doing large-scale acoustic monitoring for biodiversity metrics yeah, so as I mentioned, um, as far as it, okay. one of the projects worked, we worked with was in Cuba for detecting bats. So for, uh, obviously, uh, if you are detecting bats, in order to hear their ultrasonic calls, you have to have quite a high sample rate for it. So the audio moth um, works up to uh, 384 uh, kilohertz for the sample rate. So that's more than enough to detect almost all species of bats you're likely to be listening for. And absolutely, you can use them as um, sort of, as the same way you would use uh, camera traps. For a lot of the triggering system, uh, side of it, that will require the development of um, algorithms such as the one that we've worked on. But um, we provide a lot of support online for people to be able to set that sort of stuff up and uh, as well as like tutorials and all of our open source code is available. So yeah. But yeah, people have been using them for bats like all over the UK especially. We've had a lot of bat groups using it for a lot of interesting projects. Awesome. Um, so there uh, Marin, do you want to jump in here? I hope I said your name correctly. Uh, sorry, I got a little glitch. Is that okay? Yep, you're good. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Awesome. Uh, I was wondering that uh, given how cheap the audio moth is compared to other options, are there folks who are deploying multiple of these to try to use acoustic location or triangulation to do pinpointing of locations of certain events? Uh, yes, we have had people into that. Um, obviously, the benefit of being able to deploy so many devices is like on a very low level, you can use them for location by saying, if you deploy a, a very wide net of them, you can go, okay, well, it was near these five devices, so it's somewhere within this area. But at the same time, people have also been looking into using triangulation, so the time between them. Obviously, the, the issue with that will be the accuracy of the clock for these devices. So um, with a lot of devices that you'll be able to do triangulation with, uh, it usually will require a GPS to, in order to set the clock. Whereas the devices, there can be some loss of accuracy in terms of the clocks on these devices because they're just they're not uh, networked at all. So it is possible to do triangulation with them, although you will you do suffer in terms of accuracy a little bit with uh, the clocks slipping. Mm. It has you. been looked into. Yeah. We had a question from Macy who was um, asking about um, whether you needed permission from governments or local communities in places to implement devices and when the data is collected, how is it analyzed and implemented to, um, to inform rules or policy? Um, has it got to that point? I mean, with Belize, uh, because obviously we're, do we're putting them out there in a um, protected scientific reserve, we did have to actually have contacts within the uh, local government there. So we, have, we are in direct contact with them there. I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis with how the data is uh, actually used once it's been collected. So obviously it'll depend on how local governments feel with it. But in the, our experience in the projects that we've worked on, yeah, we have had to work quite closely with these governments to what they feel is acceptable use of the data. Um, excellent. Uh, Paul, um, I'm not sure if you had um, a mic, so I'm just going to speak for you. Um, have you investigated audio moth with, along with LoRa for real-time alerting when there's no GSM coverage, um, for example, in a single wildlife park? Yes, we have actually. We've done some tests with uh, Laura last year. Uh, one of the issues we came into, we ran into with running with Laura is uh, if you are deploying the devices in a location such as like the rainforest, there are a lot of trees, very 
trees as well, which absorb radio signals very, very well. So the range of LoRa gets limited like significantly to the point where we have to we have to explore other options with it because LoRa just isn't feasible all the time. Like with the range you're able to get, it's in the it's in the scope of like a couple of hundred meters. It gets reduced by just because the trees are so good at absorbing the signal. Right. Um, and there was a question about whether, um, do you think your acoustic device could benefit from altitude? Two Sorry, minutes. you remember that again? Do you think your, uh, the audio moth could benefit from having some altitude that, based on the fact that they, um, they design solar balloons and, and air platforms? Yeah, I think it would, because obviously a big thing that's going to reduce the like how sound is carried is going to be the terrain. So if you're in a very hilly area, being able to get up above it, above those things should make the sound carry a lot further. So yes, absolutely. And that can also help a lot with if you did want to go into the sort of communication side of it. Uh, we looked into uh, using LoRa up above the canopy. So if you put it up above the canopy, we're the we were able to use uh, LoRa much, much better. So the trees aren't absorbing it and we were able to get kilometers away with it. But that obviously requires you being able to deploy your devices up at the very top of the canopy or like quite high up. Um, and just one last question from Peter. Um, and I think this gets to a more of a, this is a question that I think comes up with a lot of conservation tech and it's around ethics and privacy. What about recording laws? Um, and he says, for example, in the US we have single and dual party consent laws by state. So, um, uh, you can only record in single party consent states without alerting people to their being recorded. So it's, it's almost like it's the question of bycatch and how we put out recorders, whether it's cameras or audio or whatever it is. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I know you're the developer of the tool rather than the necessarily the deployer, but it's something you guys have considered. Yeah. It's the sort of thing where, um, it will depend on like where you're deploying devices and how the local governments feel about these kind of things. So obviously it's going to vary on a case of case by case basis. So yeah, it'll depend on how you're using data. There are uh, steps that you can go through in order to like, um, not guess around, but like operate within it. So you can put certain filters on your recordings. So uh, you could filter out, uh, say you're listening for bats in an area but humans are known to travel through this area as well. You could put a, um, a high pass filter on it. So only the um, higher, higher frequencies, which the bats would be operating in would be recorded. So human voice wouldn't even be recorded in the data you're collecting. So you're able to do things like that to filter your data. So you're not even collecting the sensitive information that could, these laws could affect. Mm -hmm.